Have you ever wanted to turn your app ideas into passive income streams but just can't find the time? Or do you just keep building things nobody cares about? I've been there and after countless failures and finally achieving some success, I'll show you the exact steps you need to build up solo without giving up your day job. Because it's not about having all the time in the world. It's about being effective with the time you already have and to stop wasting time on the things that don't matter. We'll go through every step from finding the right problem to work on, validating that there's actually an audience for your idea, scheduling the time to work on your product consistently, the best tech stack to build and sell your product, and then finally, how to launch and market your app. All advice is geared towards building apps solo. Stick around because by the end of this video, you'll have all the knowledge you need to go from idea to your first 10 customers. So the first and most important thing is to try and think about problems instead of ideas. And I know that can sound a little bit abstract, so let me just explain. When you think about ideas from the sense of a problem, it already has built-in validation. You're looking for problems that users have and then trying to apply an idea to that rather than just coming up with an idea and then trying to apply a problem that way around. Looking for problems first means that it's way more likely that users are willing to pay for the solution to that problem. It also alleviates any possibility of idea bias. When you come up with an idea and then write it down and then tell people about it, you are already biased to the fact that that idea could work and then you'll start to sort of invent problems to try and match that idea. And at this point, we're trying to reduce the possibility as much as possible that we end up building something that no one wants. So stop trying to imagine that your idea is amazing and completely unique. I'm promise you a thousand people have already come up with that exact same idea. It's about how you execute it and about how you try and solve a user's problem. Leading on from that as well, don't try to be novel. We're trying to solve problems here and novel ideas are risky. It also means that they're really hard to explain and your marketing budget therefore would need to be greater to try and get that message across. Also try and think as well, like if your unique idea is so incredible, why haven't users already been searching for that particular idea and then being willing to pay for that particular idea? If you instead look at problems and already existing markets, you can then take a niche approach or a certain new angle on ideas or problems that already exist. So try and niche down, find new angles, and this will far more likely increase the odds that we build a product people actually want to use. Ideas that are suitable for solo founders are not the same ideas that are suitable for venture-backed startups. Don't try and build a dating app, a social network, or the next Uber. It's just not going to work. These kind of products require investment, huge marketing budgets or multi-founder teams. As a solo founder, we need to look at the kind of problems that are solvable by a single user in a reasonable amount of time and on a minimum budget. One of the key things to avoid in this case is two-sided marketplaces. This is something that I learned from Rob Walling from Startups from the Rest of Us. He talks about this idea of two-sided marketplaces, which is products such as YouTube, Uber, or Etsy, for example, where you need two different kinds of users, the vendor and the customer. In the case of YouTube, for example, you need people to upload videos and then you need users to consume that content. This is not just two times harder to pull off, it's like 10 times harder to achieve. And again, as a solo founder, it's highly impractical that this would actually work. Of course, you'll probably find a few ideas that did work, but we're trying to remove luck from this equation completely and then highly increase our odds of actually building something people want to use. So focus on problems over ideas, avoid two-sided marketplaces, and then focus on the kind of products that you can practically build as a solo founder. The next pre-build step, and this again is a super important one, is validation. If you skip this step, the likelihood that you will build something no one wants to use is incredibly high. So what I found really useful is something called the 220-200 framework, again by Rob Wallin from Startup. So the rest of us, he gives loads of practical advice for solo founders. So check out his podcast if you haven't already. I'll link that down in the description. The 220-200 framework is about initially validating an idea in two hours, then going to a second round of validation for a 20-hour process before finally spending 200 hours on actually building an MVP. Now, those numbers aren't so relevant. It's just to demonstrate the exponential increase of effort from moving between each step. So the first step, the two hour step, is about keyword research. So we've identified a few problems and we have ideas that we think could fix those problems. Now we need to do some keyword research that actually validates if users are searching for that problem. This is not SEO research. We're not trying to see if we can rank for certain keywords. We just want to see if people search for the problem and maybe if there's a certain niche or angle that's unmet at the moment. For example, if I want to build a fitness app, I could search for something like how to track macros. So this is the problem that we're trying to solve. In Ahrefs, this would present to us a bunch of user questions. So we've got here how to track macros for weight loss, how to track macros free, 
how to track alcohol macros. So this is definitely something that I wouldn't have thought of before and then maybe it's a certain angle we can take if we were to build a macro tracking app. Now the point here is to go for a bunch of different potential questions that users could be asking and then try to find these new angles that we could target. If you can prove from this point that there is a real user need for your problem, then we can start to do a little bit of competitor analysis as well. The best way to prove if there's a market is if the market already exists. If we're building apps, for example, the services like SensorTail, which allow us to see the monthly recurring revenue Revenue of existing apps on the App Store. In the case of a fitness app, for example, we can see that MyFitnessPal is making 12 million monthly recurring revenue. Now this validates that there's a massive market in the fitness space, but it doesn't prove to us if a new product can break that market. So what would be really great to find is apps on the marketplace, which we've never heard of, that are making decent monthly recurring revenue. This app here, for example, Stupid Simple Macro Tracker, I've never heard of this but it's making 50K a month MRR. So that just proves that small players can enter and carve out a chunk of that market. Now, after the keyword research and the competitor analysis, you can also do things like search online on forums like Reddit, just to see if people are actually talking about that problem. The whole benefit of this process, again, is just building up our confidence that users are willing to pay for our product. Now go through a bunch of different ideas and just do this analysis just to see if there's a product market fit. If there's not, start again with a new idea and then just repeat this process until you find something useful. Once you're confident in something, then we can move over to the 20 step. This can test directly if we can actually convert users into customers. The best way to do it is just to launch a landing page and then run a small ad campaign to see if we can get users to the website and actually giving us their email addresses. This helps us build up an initial newsletter and also proves to us that users are willing to give up some information to solve their problem. I highly recommend an app like Framer to build a website really quickly and then run an ad campaign on the most practical platform for your idea. It could be TikTok, Meta or Google Ads, for example. What I tend to do is run an ad campaign for about $100 in this time, I'm just tweaking the landing page copy and the ad copy to see what resonates with users. If I land on something that has a decent conversion rate, then I can use that data to project how effective my app would be once it actually exists. If you can't get users at this point, you're still not gonna get users when the app's built. So don't go spending 200 hours building something then just to run an ad campaign that doesn't work. Prove it now and then move on to the next step. Once our idea is validated and we're actually confident there's a market need, we can move over to building the MVP. And just because you use AWS and Terraform in your day job doesn't mean that you should use this as a solo founder. We wanna offload all responsibility that's slowing us down from actually launching an MVP. So to host, use platforms like Superbase, Heroku, Versal, Netlify, these are like kind of having a DevOps on your team for a very minimal cost. We're not trying to think about how we can scale to thousands of users when we have zero users at this point. So we just wanna get something over the line. Even when the MVP is built, we're still in the validation phase. So don't assume that this MVP you're creating is the perfect idea. We'll just put the minimal product out there, we'll get users in, and then we'll start to change it with user feedback. Only when there's a need to scale do we actually think about scaling the app. Now, depending on the type of product you're making, it could be a mobile app, a website, just use the framework that you're already familiar with. It's probably React, might be Vue. If you're working on mobile, maybe go React Native, Expo, or if you're already familiar with a native platform like iOS or Android, build for that. But don't just keep trying to learn brand new tech every time you build a new project. This is just gonna slow you down and then decrease the odds that you actually launch the MVP. Even though we've validated the idea, there's still a huge amount of risk that we're building something nobody wants. So if we can reduce the burden to get that MVP into the market and then genuinely prove it, we can quickly iterate and then move on to the next thing if it's not working. To handle payments, if you're building on mobile, obviously you have to use Google or Apple Pay. If you're building a website, then I highly recommend a platform like Stripe. The transaction fee is actually incredibly low for the amount of time that you save. And the developer experience is actually fantastic with Stripe, including really well-written documentation. Now, you're not expected to be a fantastic designer as well, so use tools and services which already introduce good design patterns. Existing UI libraries like Chakra, Tailwind, or ShadCN, for example, you can even build our entire interface is now with v0.dev from Vercel. And for any extra design resources you need, you can obviously turn to things like Canva or UI8, where you can download premium design assets for a small fee. All of this is just reducing the need for you to sit in Figma and obsessing over the border radius of a button for two hours. We just need to remove all of this distraction and use existing tools that help us focus on the important tasks. We can of course now use AI to accelerate our development, so I recommend IDEs like Cursor 
and then platforms like ChatGPT to scaffold projects, write unit tests, and even implement functions for us. If you're not sure on how to approach a certain type of architecture, then I find ChatGPT fantastic for just bouncing ideas off before you just go and implement that code. Finally on tech, I highly recommend against maintaining your own boilerplate. The reason being, this is just an entire project in itself and it will constantly fall out of date. So trying to just keep all of the dependencies up to date and following the most recent patterns is going to be a nightmare. What I would recommend instead is just clone in your most recent project that is most similar in scope to the new project you're working on. For example, I run a platform called GraphDev, which is a browser-based IDE for GraphQL developers. I cloned this and repurposed it into Arcuate a research assistant for architects and city planners. Now those apps are obviously completely different, but they had a similar tech stack. So I just cloned the project, changed the theme, removed all of the stuff that I didn't care about, and then I didn't have to re-implement auth, database, the UI framework. It was just all ready for me to then go build custom features on top of that. When building the app as well, just try and focus on one feature that solves a user problem. Don't try and build this multi-feature massive app that could end up blowing up in scope because I guarantee everything you imagine will take way longer to build than you expected. So just try and keep the scope small so we can get to market quickly and then try and validate the idea even more. During the build of the app and then afterwards, we obviously need to market it. Now, of course, there are many marketing channels available, but we need to choose the one that's most practical for our application. If we're building a B2B app, for example, organic TikTok is probably not the right way to go. If we're building like a B2C fitness app, that would be a fantastic marketing channel. But the options are ads, SEO, building your own audience, paid and organic social, and then finally cold outreach. Now, since we've already built a landing page and then run a small ad campaign to see if we can get conversions, this can also be a great marketing channel to sort of bootstrap and continue to validate our idea now that we have a product ready. Obviously, this requires somewhat of a marketing budget. So if you don't have that, then we need to look at different approaches. SEO is really scalable, but of course, it takes a really long time to actually get that up and running to decent numbers. So it can be a really good idea at the start to start focusing some attention to this but know that it's not gonna get you your first 10 or 20 customers. Building your own audience, again, fits into the same category as SEO, in my opinion. It can take a really long time to get up and running, but once it's there, it can bring in a lot of new customers. So if you're doing B2B, for example, I would recommend ads and then maybe cold outreach. And then if you're doing B2C, I'd recommend ads and then paid and organic social. In the case of our fitness app, for example, you can create a brand new page on TikTok and then just start creating posts. And then TikTok will actually promote those posts even though they're coming from a new account. So this can be a cheap and effective marketing strategy for trying to build up that initial interest in a product. If you wanna scale a lot quicker than that, then paid social is another fantastic option. I would recommend initially approaching small influencers. If you go after the big ones, they're gonna expect huge fees for promoted posts, but the smaller influencers will of course post for a smaller fee. So try and find influencers in your niche, reach out for them, ask if they'd be willing to do paid promotions, and then just try and negotiate a fee based on your expected sign up rate. There are apps out there at the moment like PuffCount, which I think makes 40K a month, and then Cal AI, which is making millions of pounds a month, I think and they actually run on organic and paid social. All of this can be incredibly stressful if you've actually got a nine to five jobs and other family commitments as well. So it's really important to try and carve out some time consistently every day that you can work on this business. If you just try and throw all of your time into it immediately, you will immediately just burn out and crash. And this is not a practical way to build a successful app long-term. What I would recommend instead is choosing the exact same time every morning. So what I do is every morning, wake up at 6 a.m., give myself an hour to get ready, have breakfast, and not stress out. And then from 7 a.m. till 9 a.m., I work solely on my products. This means there's less risk of burnout. I can have a deep work session with no distractions. And then for the rest of the day, in the back of my mind, I can sort of start to think about what I'm gonna be doing the next day. So when you come to your desk the next morning, you can just start work and then focus purely at the task at hand, rather than just getting distracted by unimportant tasks. It also means that you get guilt-free time to do things like watching Netflix or spending time with friends and family. If you try and work 24 seven, I guarantee you will not get an app to production. It's just completely impractical and you actually end up being really inefficient with your time. If you give yourself a fixed block of time every day, it means that you're gonna use that time to its maximum effectiveness. Two hours every morning doesn't seem like a lot, but that's 14 hours a week if you include weekends, 56 hours a month, 
So when you add it up like that, you can start to see how you can get quite a lot done if you're being really, really effective with that time. If you want me to go into any of these in more detail, then please let me know in the comments and I can do a separate video just on that. But that was a brief overview of finding the right problem, valid that in your ideas, the tech, marketing and time management. If you like this video, please leave a comment and subscribe and I'll see you guys in the next one.